probably I could ask you the same question. Uh, do your clients know what they want? Or do they just think they do? Really, in working with some quite big branded names rather than smaller pottery workshops. So there is a climate of knowing what you want and that you want something new. Uh, but exactly what way to go, because there will be an infinite number of different ways you could go. Uh, to, to drag that down and define it is, uh, from the options, it's very, very intuitive. It depends on the education and the breadth of experience of the client and the education and the breadth of experience of the designer. And it is very much a discussion rather than, in some ways, John, I don't know, an analysis. It's a discussion. You know, we could do this. It could be made there. They would do it very well. We could, on the other hand, do this. You know, we go a completely different direction. You know, should we just make a wonderful range of small things for the way people want to eat tapas and antipasti and all the first parts of the menu anywhere in the world is small things. You know, we, we could do that, forget all the dinner plate and the this, that and the other. And so these discussions go on and we finally say, okay, we've got a given amount of time, we want to do this within, say, a year of development. And so let's get going at that bit. Later on, maybe we'll do a dinner plate. I mean, it was very... By, by the way, Martin, I'm going to interrupt you for a second. I think I just saw uh, John's heart skip a beat when you said forget all those dinner plates. I think he doesn't want to forget the dinner no, plates. No, no. My, my, my point was, that I hope I, I didn't confuse, the dinner plate is vital, but the conversation uh, must not be all about dinner plates because the way the world is, the way people eat, and in a way where the exciting foods lie, the exciting foods are always lie on a dinner plate. Also, food is uh, a lot more about the theater of what's happening at the table as well as the restaurant or place you might be in. So I think one of you also mentioned that not only about plates, but about whatever type of vessel it might be, even an odd shape or a little thing at the top, or it comes out in two pieces and something gets poured or transferred from one vessel to another. Uh, it makes for part of the theater of the dining area dining experience. Also, you know, one of the ways that uh, as chefs that we work often, uh, unfortunately, rarely being able to have the time or the expense to work directly with somebody like Martin to be able to design from the ground up, more often we're working with guys like Steelite. In fact, I did a project this summer uh, where, you know, I spent a couple hours in the showroom basically pulled off everything that even interested me, lay it out. At the end of the day, I think I bought 10, 10 different pieces, but I looked at 50, and it took me like two weeks to kind of just start taking ones away until I got to the process of thinking, this is the collection for the food that I want to make in the project that I'm working on. And that was a great process, but it takes time. So while I didn't create those plates and vehicles and vessels, I was able to create my own version of it. And to Tommaso's point of, you know, sometimes we think we know what we want, but very often I'll be there, I would have never chosen that piece over there, and I've got three or four pieces laid out that I really love, and the person in the showroom might say, look what happens when I put that next to it. You know, it's a, it's a good experience. And I think it's true also on, on, on the other election, me and Martin was saying that, that together we're gonna factor your spend time, uh, weeks and hours, trying to design something for a specific purpose. And then you come up with that project, you give it to them, and they use for something completely different. So that, that's what happened also a lot of times. Yeah, I think that the big table on which you lay out the Steelite product and a few other things and mix it is the best design tool we've got. The big table, the big empty space that you can stand back with your colleagues and look at it and say, now let's just run through everything we want to do. 
uh, and trying to do things in the average showroom with plates standing on their edges, you know, high up and a confusion of objects is the very last place that one can make proper decisions. So I think the big table is, is the modern design tool. If, if you take a look at tableware today, it's probably, in my career, 25 years doing this, it's certainly the most exciting time that is out there in tableware. The challenge for any of us who are manufacturers is that, you know, at Stele, we stock now 19,800 SKUs, um, you know, in our Pennsylvania warehouse. And, you know, those 19,000 plus SKUs, you know, relate to design trends and different people. So, you know, as, as, as the other gentlemen on the panel were saying, when you come into a showroom, everyone has a different, everybody has a different painting in mind. And what you have to have is a really very complete palette that goes all the way from Panera Bread all the way to the Rainbow Room and everything in between with all the accessory elements. And it's unbelievably exciting, but you know, unbelievably challenging to try to maintain. You know, we're, we're launching at a rate of 600 new items a year. And, you know, doing that and keeping that momentum to feed the market for what everyone wants is, it, it really is a challenge. It's, it's not an easy thing. And I, I think that another challenge in that direction is that uh, to keep the identity of your brand, of your company, because like for any restaurant, it's key to have an identity because right now customers have a lot of options. So when they go to a place, they, they want to know what they're going to experience. Also from, from the manufacturer, it's extremely <coughs> important to keep uh, the, those characteristics that define their identities uh, and at the same time keep innovating and keep chasing what the market needs. Tommaso, you said something to me a couple of weeks ago. You said the first time you go meet with a customer, you don't take any catalogs, you don't take any product, you just go and, and listen. But how do you get to where you're laying out this big table? Somebody like that? Yeah. What we, this is what we usually like to do if we can, because uh, uh, as I said, you can have access now to like thousand and thousand of different uh, plates made in the market. So when you go to a meet for the first time, a restaurant, want to open a place and you don't have like a brief of what they want to do. I mean, for me, there's no sense to bring them option if you don't know what you're working on. So usually our first presentation are pretty brief, but they just have a sense of a feeling of what they want to do. And then starting from that, we start from some idea and we start drawing in this big canvas of the big table. I think that's definitely a key point because, you know, an interior designer would never go to meet with the, the, cust the client before they even design the, the building or the house, right? So I, I appreciate that that's your approach. When people come to see me uh, and they're selling an item like like, uh, like China and Flatware, that they, they come and listen to what we have to say. Here's what our thoughts are. And then on the next go around, so based on what you told me, here's like a lot of options, but I've narrowed it down a lot based on what you told me and either from there go to that showroom and work on that big table. That's where the magic happens, is on that big table. And at that point, I want to hear your suggestions because you guys have seen it all, you've designed it, you, you touch it every day. So, you know, the other part is as an operator, we certainly, we don't know everything. We think we do. Uh, it's sort of inherent to our, our You business. always told me you do everything. Well, I do. Always. But, uh, but I, I always take input from people who are experts at what they do, and that's the best way to be successful. For sure, these guys have something that I, I've never seen, and putting it down next to the three things that I love from them already might be like, wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, but at the same time, we need your input because you are the one that, you know, to use them, and it's your food, and it's the place that we can supply, it's like the background for it. Many, many times that, that situation has happened where I've chosen three or four or five things, and someone, either from the creative side or the sales side, said, by the way, have you seen this? And I hadn't seen it, and I wasn't planning on something like that, but I end up designing a dish for the menu because of the, because of the plate, or the vessel. John, in the, in the 19,000 plus SKUs you have, how do, where do you start narrowing that? How do you bring all that 
equal opportunity to an operator like Ed. How do you show them how overwhelming? Well, it, it is exactly what, what Ed described. Our first meeting is not with a sample case. You know, our first meeting is to understand what, what the customer is trying to accomplish. So the look and the feel, um, the soul of the operation, whatever it is. Uh, and then, you know, the service limitations or the service expectations, and then the menu and what they're trying to achieve with, with the menu and execution. And then what they don't want to be is really important because, you know, identity, um, as one of these gentlemen said, is really, really important in today's world. Everyone is trying to create their own identity, their own tabletop. They're trying to be unique. So, you know, it's important to understand who they don't want to look like and what else is in the market because you, you never, ever want to try to replicate a tabletop for someone. You know, that's, you know, in our business, that's really bad practice. If you're going door to door trying to sell everybody the same tabletop, you're not, you're not doing your job. And, and then, you know, just as, as Ed described, then it comes down to a showroom visit or a visit with samples. And, 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 and it's multiple, it's multiple times that you have to meet, you know, and, and you narrow and, and then you begin to get a feel. And out of those 19,000 SKUs, you start to pull and understand, you know, what works, what doesn't work. And, you know, in, in many cases, you know, we have a massive range of product. In many cases, we don't have everything. So, you know, and a lot of times we're actually referring to a competitor for some of the items to say, you know, we've built 85% of what you want. In order to complete what you want, you need to go here or there. And, you know, we give references of other quality manufacturers and, you know, the customer goes out and completes the tabletop and, and everyone's happy. Martin, I have a question on, the, on where the, on back to the design element, do, if a client would come to you, and ask you to design XYZ piece, um, would you try, uh, did they also tell you the material, because somebody mentioned materials are changing now, they also mentioned the material in taking into account perhaps their expertise in manufacture, or do you, do you suggest other things, or are you, uh, where does, I mean, when you listen to a client give you a brief, as you say, do you then think of that client's skills, and, or do you just give them the best product you can? A manufacturer of ceramics or ed or you know, it's where it's coming from and uh, I suppose pointing out the options of where it could go and so it is this first consultation to put it like your general practitioner you know when you've got a pain in your leg uh, before you know you bring in the specialist and uh, you know somebody who can see the full breadth of the picture uh, that might apply to you uh, and offer you suggestions and say you know Martin perhaps you should drink a little less wine and then you decide oh yeah you balance this up with how delicious it is and, and, and make the final selection uh, I don't know if that really is answering your question Dave. Well, I, I mean it's, it's yeah, I'm thinking of sometimes back to the original idea that maybe the client really doesn't know what they want and you, you're steering them with some knowledge of it. And I suspect it's probably uh, uh, different for each client, obviously, because you, you've dealt well with great apparel, right? You design things for great Yeah, yeah great we, we designed a tremendous amount for retail. And, I, and what always surprises me, I remember going with the Dudson Company years and years ago, uh, at the time of the NRA in Chicago, to one of the leading hotels where they had a friendly chef and asked him to pull everything out that he used onto the table, which of course included Dudson's products. And uh, we said, where did these French soup pots with a you know big exaggerated lid come from? He said, oh, those four things come from Creighton Barrel across the road. And I'm always amazed that there's this wealth of things not designed for food service out in the world of ceramics and glass for retail, often made in exactly the same materials like high quality porcelain or stoneware or china uh, that is used for food service products and they're not used. There's an absolute wealth. And, uh, so 
your job, Tommaso, you know, in a way falls in amongst this because the possibilities in all this and they can be bought off the shelf in modest quantities generally. Yeah, we go back to the point that everybody wants something different and sometimes like the, the chef or the experience of picking something from the shelf and put in the big table, that's what they do when they go to some retail stores. They go in the retail store and they shop around and maybe they, they find something that inspires them and they get it used at the restaurants. But then the challenge is to transfer the, the feeling that they got from a retail product in, in, in a massive or in a, a, a larger scale operation because it might work in a small cafe or the restaurants but then when you have to transfer that in a bigger operation then it becomes sometimes difficult to use uh, retail uh, retail products and, and that's where sometimes we use some retail products or not commercial products for like asset pieces or signature dishes and when we keep the, the, the dinnerware or the vessel that uh, are the volume of the restaurant to something which is more commercial grade so we balance the uh, durability and the, the operation uh, together with the identity of, of the property. I, 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 first of all, Mark, any doctor who tells you to drink less wine, you need to find a new doctor. Start with that. But uh, I also use retail pieces often. Um, mostly when I'm doing uh, either a photo shoot or setting for a television set if we're doing a program. A lot of those retail pieces have a lot of charm and appeal, and I don't necessarily want it to look like a restaurant. I want, especially on a TV show, I want people to feel like it's something they can relate to at home. And there's a lot of use for those retail pieces, and a lot of them have the very same quality, as you said. Um, but I also like using them in the restaurant for accent pieces. You know, a, a chowder pot, a cauldron-looking pot that was in the middle of the table, is a really fun looking ladle that we're serving this very beautiful uh, rich seafood stew to each guest or something that just holds like two things that goes on the table it's just you know uh, there's little accents to the program one point that we haven't touched on you know we've been talking on the creative the, the less sexy version is you know when I also speak with these, these guys I'd say listen by the way I do have a budget by the way, it's going to be a high volume place and it needs to be durable as hell or it can be less durable. Uh, you know, this is my wear washing system and there's a situation there that you should know about. Uh, those are really important parts as an operator because, you know, I can buy whatever I want. I don't really want to buy it again too soon. And it's always a quite media operation, it's always uh, an issue that we evaluate, especially. For example, when you talk more about the glassware or the silverware, uh, the, the, what is the, your washing area is very important. And if uh, it's a big hotel or a larger operation, if you have a dedicated washing area for every outlet, or you have one central one, so then it comes to the decision to use the same silverware, different silverware, because then create more work in, in, in other areas that they are in the background. John, with, with all the, the range of the steelite item system, but it's just talking about that practicality issue, but also still being able to offer fine, high-end bone china from Royal Brown Garvey, that kind of thing. Did that really come into play? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think it's uh, it's horses for horses in our business, and that's why you know that's why the skew count has to be so high. That's why you know you, you've got to have the broadness and range. You know, if, if, if you look at Ed's operations, I mean, they're doing some of the Minus corporate dining, you know, anywhere in the world, and, and they also have some operations that are quality volume operations, and the need is just different. And you know, once you establish that with the customer, and you understand where they're at on what I call the pyramid. You know, then you can start to talk about brands and products and solutions. I mean, the the very you know the breadth inside one company, and we're not the biggest company, but just inside our own company. You know, we might be doing the Kennedy Center Honors Banquet for 2,000 guests, plated seated dinner. Uh, the members dining room at the Met Museum is a small, refined place. The project that I bought the products for this summer is a very fast-paced, upscale restaurant at the U.S. Open, uh, tennis, where I needed a great look, but this stuff was going to get beat up. I was going to have to do 700, 800 covers in a day in a restaurant that exists for 14 days of the year and then goes to sleep. 
So all of that temporary staff, they're not treating it like your usual staff would. The place is turning fast, it's busy as heck. So all those things come into play and uh, we actually ended up making great choices. Uh, uh, you'll be very aware that the, there is a tsunami of the whole world of ceramics rushing towards this business. And the idea of white porcelain or other white and strong products uh, is, is not king any longer. Uh, a uh, colleague of ours, much younger than me, who's superb on social media, and particularly social media amongst designers and restaurateurs, produces, and I use the word tsunami again, a tsunami of images from around the world from colleagues. I could show you some here on an iPad. It is phenomenal. And you look at all these beautiful studio pottery, hand-thrown objects, very often beautiful glazes, glazes and finishes from the 16 and a half thousand years of our subject, practical ceramics, which you can see in museums. Objects like our gentleman friends over there, at, uh, <laughs> and uh, that, that this is all out there and people are using it in restaurants of the small scale. But the dilemma uh, we have is twofold because we want to do these things at a slightly larger scale and John with Steelite are already masters of this. Now, first there is a world paucity of manufacturers who can make this sort of thing in quantity production and reasonably durable. Two is, it ain't all durable. So Ed's got to make the decision that if I'm going to eat off a piece of slate or a piece of terracotta, you know, made by an Indian guy that he cooks his pots over the, the fires and it's absolutely wonderful, delicious looking stuff, wonderful to serve on. You know, it may have a shelf life or a usage life that is just a few trips. So it becomes like the uh, carton in which your milk comes rather than the milk bottle of old that was delivered onto your front doorstep and then taken away and washed and filled with milk again. So we are facing this. It's very, very exciting because as I say for me, in the sort of academic world of teaching ceramics and in design, you know, to use this whole vocabulary is just going to be fabulous. And I've been talking to one or two people today and maybe this is a job for Dave and Tabletop Magazine. There doesn't seem to be any sort of handbook of how you should use different materials and what you might expect. The almost the buy this beautiful terracotta object uh, that's made by some ladies in Sri Lanka in the jungle. And uh, but be it on your own head, but for these reasons. And I think that we need to find some way of determining some of these things so that people can go into these things with their eyes open. Uh, because otherwise it's a chance that is missed to use superb things.